First of all, we should, we should bear in mind that we don't have a capitalist system. And no capitalist system has ever survived. It would self-destruct in five minutes. Uh, so what we have is a kind of state capitalist system with the state playing a substantial role in American history, a very substantial role in economic development, in production, in uh, research and development, uh, um, a lot of other bailouts, lots of other devices to keep uh, the private sector viable. So it's a kind of a state capitalist system, uh, like others. Uh, they vary a little on how they do it. So is there an alternative to this? Of course. Uh, for example, the alternative that was uh, taken for granted by 19th century workers before it was sort of beaten out of people's heads by massive propaganda. But you go back to the early Industrial Revolution, which was right around here, eastern Massachusetts. Uh, it was the period probably the freest press ever in the United States. There were lots and lots of newspapers uh, representing different ethnic groups, class you know, workers, uh, uh, all sorts of people. And they were, there was a lot of participation, direct participation, uh, a very lively press, widely read, and so on. Uh, and if you look at the working class press, uh, they were expressing the common view of working people, namely that uh, the fir those who work in the mills should own them and run them. Yeah, that's very natural. And as I say, we've come close to that a number of times, terrifying to private owners. You can't have meaningful political democracy without functioning economic democracy. And I think this is uh, at some level understood by uh, working people. It has to be brought to awareness and consciousness, but it's just below the surface. And in fact, things are happening. So uh, some of the most interesting are uh, uh, around the in Ohio, around the Cleveland area, Cleveland Project, there's uh, a dozen, maybe hundreds of, uh, uh, not huge, but uh, significant enterprises that are worker-owned, worker-managed. Uh, in some places there are, in, uh, the biggest one, the biggest worker-owned uh, collection of conglomerate is Mondragon and uh, the Basque Country. That's worker-owned, but not worker-managed. And it's, uh, you know, uh, industries, banks, uh, schools, and uh, communities, a very broad uh, configuration. And there are various other elements of it uh, here and there. Uh, a couple of quite good books have just come out about it, one by Gar Garl Perovitz, America Beyond Capitalism, which is about the worker-owned uh, enterprises uh, that are sprouting around the country. And this could go much beyond. And in fact, I think we can also go back to the days of, uh, that were beginning in the 1930s of takeover of uh, industrial production. And there are cases of it. Now, there are cases uh, where we have come pretty close to uh, workers taking over, workers and communities uh, taking over industry and producing things that can be needed. And that, if there was enough public support, that could have been done in the last few years. So, for example, when Obama took over the auto industry, it was basically nationalized. Uh, and there were a couple of paths that could have been followed. Uh, one path was the one that was followed, uh, reconstitute it, uh, give it back to essentially the same, you know, banks, management, and so on, a couple of different names. That was one way. Public paid for that. An alternative was to hand it over to communities and the workforce and have them uh, turn to producing things that the country very badly needs, like, say, high-speed rail. Uh, skilled workers in uh, the Rust Belt uh, have the capacity, uh, with a little help, to do that. And the country badly needs it, and they need the jobs. And that uh, rebuilds a popular movement, which can be, again, on the forefront of change. That's, these are possibilities. And across the board, there's an, any number of things we can do. So I don't think there's any shortage of opportunities. There's a shortage of uh, dedication to making use of those opportunities. The sit-down strikes, uh, which were began at a significant level in the 1930s, were very threatening to, uh, 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 to management and ownership because a sit-down strike is 
one step before taking over the factory and having the workers taking over the factory and running it and kicking out the managers uh, and probably doing a better job. Democratic control of uh, institutions, whether they're communities or workplaces or any others, uh, alliances among them, you know, federal arrangements. Uh, uh, these are all perfectly feas feasible alternatives. There's no uh, economic or political theory that tells us there's anything wrong with them. Uh, they conflict with the structure of existing power systems and therefore uh, the educational and cultural system tries to drive them out of your minds and make them seem you know, insane or crazy or unthinkable. But there's nothing unthinkable about them. And uh, you can move towards realizing them. In fact, in, even in the United States, where you, know, you get no major discussion of these things, now, there are probably thousands of uh, self-managed enterprises, not huge ones, but lots of them, and they're growing. And they could, as I mentioned, they could reach the scale of, uh, say, producing the uh, green technology, high-speed rail, and so on, that the country badly needs. It's not a law of nature that we have to import uh, solar technology from China, uh, you know, a poor developing country, or that we have to get high-speed rail facilities from Spain. Those aren't laws of nature. Those are political decisions, social, economic and political decisions. They can be made differently. If they're made differently enough, we'll be moving towards a um, you know, kind of an anarchist-type society.